Okay, let's get started. So the main topic for today is naive Bayes models. But the real context here is that today will be our first lecture on machine learning. Up until now, we have been assuming that somebody gives us a model. They give us a search problems. They give us a search problem, there are weights on the edges. There's a game, there's probabilities of the chance nodes. Um, we have a Bayes net, and there's a bunch of conditional probabilities that we use to do computation with. And we've looked at how to use that model to make optimal decisions, whether that's thinking about sequencing actions in the first part of the course, or managing inferences over uncertainty in the second part of the course. And now we're going to shift gears and look at machine learning, which is about how to acquire a model, how to acquire the parameters of a model from data and experience. So in the end, we want to build good systems. We want to build accurate systems. Where do you get accurate systems? You, you get them from good models. And good models come from good data. And we're going to look at that last part now. So what are the kinds of things we could learn? We could learn parameters. These are the individual numbers and uh, other details that determine exactly how our model works. For example, the probabilities that live in each conditional probability table of a Bayes net. That's an example of parameters. We could learn structure. So we could learn, for example, given a bunch of random variables and then a bunch of data showing observations of those random variables, we could learn something about correlations or maybe even causation between those variables and use that to build a Bayes net. We can also learn hidden concepts. We can take data, we can cluster that data, we can look for patterns. Neural nets, which are um, a very big topic in machine learning now, are in a lot of ways all about learning hidden representations um, and hidden concepts. What we're going to do today is we're going to start with model-based classification. And as an example of that, we're going to work through some details of how the naive Bayes models work. Then in the next few lectures, we're going to work through um, a sequence of different takes on machine learning that are going to highlight uh, different, different subsets of the big ideas on this topic. So today we're going to talk about classification. We're going to have a couple running examples. One of them is that spam classifier that pulls out all the emails you don't want from your email. Another one we're going to look at is digit recognition. These are simple classification problems in some ways. right? The inputs are sort of well understood and the outputs are well understood. But we can already see a lot of the big ideas in machine learning. And you could also see how something like spam classification starts to give you a little bit of a window into how other natural language tasks work. And something like digit recognition will start to give you a window into how other vision tasks work. And we'll see more uh, in-depth examples and more structured examples of these kinds of problems later when we talk about applications. So here's an example of a spam filter. This is an example of a classification system. Classification is not the only kind of machine learning, but it's probably the biggest. So classification has an input and an output. And the whole point is to automate the prediction of the output on the basis of the input. So the input might be an email. And the output is the decision. Is this spam or is this a good email, which people work on spam call ham? So how would this work? Well, first, we need some data. And we'll see today exactly how data kind of goes through the mill and gets turned into a model. But you need data to learn what is a good email, what is a spam email. And so you need to get a large collection of these. In practice, in the real world, getting the right kind of data is often one of the hardest parts of building and deploying a machine learning system. So where are we going to get a large collection of example emails? Well, we could take some email accounts, get people to agree to let us look at those emails, have humans hand label them. That's one way. You could also build a kind of an ecosystem in, that naturally generates this data. For example, a lot of you in your email accounts see spam. You mark that as spam. And uh, congratulations, you've just labeled some training data for a classifier. Um, somebody has to hand label this data. And that can be expensive, or it can just fall out of the ecosystem that you have around you. And how easy it is to deploy machine learning systems often depends on how natural it is to collect that data or to discover that data, how costly, what you have to do in order to make that data uh, reasonable to produce. We're not going to talk about, a lot about that in this class, but when you actually get into the real world and you're thinking about deploying machine learning systems, data is often the first thing and the biggest thing you worry about. 
So how are we going to make these decisions? Well, we have a bunch of data, like what's shown on the right. I'll read you some of these. These are from an actual, um, these are from an exact, an actual corpus collection of data that's labeled that people use. Um, th this one is relatively small and it's an older corpus, but this is a corpus of email that people use, uh, to test this problem. So here's, here's one. You guys, CS188 classifier, using the parameters in your head. We're gonna decide spam or ham. Dear sir, first I must solicit your confidence in this transaction. This is by virtue of its nature as being utterly confidential and top secret. What do you think? Spam? It looks really important. Yeah, it's spam. Um, here's the next one. To be removed from future mailing, simply reply to this message and put remove in the subject. 99 million email addresses for only $99. Spam? I mean, that's like a million email addresses per dollar. Yeah, that's bad. You don't want that one. All right. Okay, I know this is blatantly off topic, but I'm beginning to go insane. Had an old Dell Dimension XPS sitting in the corner and decided to put it to use. I know it was working pre-being stuck in the corner, but when I plugged it in, hit the power, nothing happened. Hammer spam. Yeah, so this is ham. Whether you personally wish to receive this email, this is between you and your friends, right? But this is an email that was intentionally sent from somebody who probably knows the the recipient here, and you would have to go through and label this. In the case of email, it's very uh, very much um, an individual question which emails you want to receive or not, and so the, the boundary between what is actually spam, unsolicited commercial email, whatever, and emails you just don't want, this can be a fuzzy boundary, and this is a problem when people are just clicking the spam button. Some people just click that on an email they wish people hadn't sent them, even if it's like from their mom. Um, how are you going to make this decision that you all just did so effortlessly? What is it about the top two emails that let you conclude that they're spam, and how could we automate this? Well, the machine learning is going to do some amount of work, but something has to power this. There has to be something about those first emails that's going to give you the clues that something's fishy here. And so what kinds of features can you include? Defining these features is a big part of deploying machine learning systems. So the basic features in a task like spam detection are the words. And so there are going to be some words that are big giveaways that we have, uh, we have spam on our hands. So probably, um, probably something about only $99. That's probably a sign of spam. But it's not like those words couldn't occur in ham or this... Uh, Utterly confidential and top secret. That's probably a, that, that phrase is probably a bad sign, but it's not like that couldn't occur. And so each of these features is going to be something that you can think of as a noisy indicator. It's going to give you a little bit of confidence in the probabilistic sense that perhaps there's spam here, but no one of these things is just going to uh, put that to rest. And so what we're going to need to be able to do is build a model that can aggregate that information, combine all of those little bits of weak evidence, manage that uncertainty, and then give us a, a prediction. So the words present in spam are really important, and that's sort of the basic first cut, because these are documents and you want to put them into categories, but there's a lot else you can look at. For example, maybe any dollar sign followed by some numbers is a, is, is a bad sign, and that's a feature that abstracts over individual words, and you can either put some effort into coming up with these features, or you can look at even more advanced machine learning techniques that would automate their induction. In this second one, to be removed from future mailings, one big sign that this is spam here is just all caps. That's a bad sign. That's no individual word being in caps that's a bad sign. It's sort of that, uh, that aggregate feature, and so that's a feature you might want to add. In practice, for actual spam detection, a lot of the evidence of spam versus ham comes not from the word or even the content of the email in any way, but rather its relation to other things in the ecosystem. For example, is the sender of this email in, in your contacts? Well, if it is, this is probably not spam, even if it's got some sort of marginal uh, contents. Has this email been widely broadcast within a short amount of time? Obviously, your email account can't tell this, but your email account provider can because they can see the behavior of similar email, uh, emails appearing in lots of different inboxes all at once. So you're going to collect some amount of these features, and then some magic's going to happen in the middle where we're going to build a model and make predictions, and then out is going to pop um, classifications of either spam or ham. Let's do another example. This example is another classic one. The input's going to be images. Think of them as a matrix, a grid of pixels. Uh, they can be black and white. They can be grayscale, whatever. The output is going to be a digit, 0 through 9. What's the setup for this? We're going to have to collect a large number of example images. Each one has to be labeled, this is a 7, this is a 2, this is a 4. Somebody has to hand label all this. 
or somebody has to design an ecosystem where this stuff is sort of self-labeling. We want to be able to predict labels of new images that are not the ones we've already seen. Okay, so that's actually, it's subtle, but it's super important. We are not, like, this is not, this is not the, the sort of the Pokemon collection uh, task here where we have to collect every digit, every image, right? Every image you see of a digit is going to be unique. It's going to be at least one pixel off of something else you've seen. So you can't just collect all the data. You can get data that is similar, but then in the end, you're going to have to generalize. And so we'll talk about how that's going to work. What features might you use to detect um, digits? Well, somebody puts a grid of numbers. Your eyes and your visual processing system is already doing all kinds of processing. And people who think about computer vision replicate some of that processing. You're doing all kinds of processing when you look at a, a digit and you say, oh, that's a four. Um, but here, you know, this one might be a zero. We could go and we could label these things. And we're going to try to teach a computer to do the same thing. What's the next one? It's probably a one. But I'm not like totally sure. What's the next one? It's a two. That slash is probably a one. And then I don't really know what that's supposed to be. And so this is actually a real issue, right? There's a lot of inputs that are really noisy. And your training set, they might be hard, expensive to label because they're noisy. You might get them wrong. You might mislabel them. And then your algorithms have to be robust to a certain amount of noise in your training set. And then at test time, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes because machine learning is not perfect. You're going to make mistakes because some inputs are just really, really hard, and they're going to look like this, and we're just not all even going to agree on what the heck that's supposed to be. So if you wanted to make a decision that that top thing is a 0 and the next one is a 1, you're probably going to look at the pixels. Those are the basic features. But if you think about it, that's not really the most invariant representation, because I could take that zero and I could just shift it a couple pixels to the side, and it's going to be an entirely different set of pixels that are on, but it's still the same number. So people think about computer vision, think about invariances. What are better representations that if the thing gets tilted or it's a little bit lighter or it's, uh, or it's a little bit smaller or bigger, it's not the exact pixels being on that we care about. But the pixels are something we could use. We could look at other kinds of patterns. We can look at how many connected components of ink there are. What's the aspect ratio? How many loops are there? Um, it's increasingly the case, especially for problems like this, that we feed in low-level features like pixels, and higher-level features like edges um, tend to get induced increasingly more as our machine learning methods get better at doing that. Um, and we'll talk about that in a couple weeks when we talk about neural nets. All right, there's tons of classification tasks. It's probably the most widely... Uh, used application of machine learning. There's also a lot of uh, applications of other things like clustering. Classification, you're given inputs, you predict labels or classes Y. Inputs are called X, outputs are called Y. And there's tons of examples of this. Medical diagnosis could be classification. The input is the system, the output is the diseases. Fraud detection could be, think of your credit card company. There's some account activity and you want to red flag accounts that are suspicious. Think about all the different kinds of features you could put in in order to make those kinds of decisions, both at the individual transaction level and also at the network level. Automatic essay grading, auto grading. This can be a machine learning problem. Customer service email routing. You have a whole bunch of customer service agents that do all different kinds of things. Emails are flying into the system and you'd like to automate the routing of that. Review sentiment. There's a bunch of reviews of my product. Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? Have they gotten better in the past 10 days since the new announcement? And so on. You can do that with classification. Language identification. Here's this document. What language is this anyway? You've got to do that before you can do things like translation. Of course, what, once you do translation, that's not a classification task anymore. That's a much more structured natural language processing task where you actually need to generate new language that means the same thing in a different language. So classification is important. Um, at the end of the lecture today, you will have enough information to go and build a basic classifier, but there's a whole bunch of detail uh, behind all this. The first thing we're going to do is talk about model-based classification. Remember we talked about reinforcement learning? We talked about model-based reinforcement learning and model-free reinforcement learning. There's going to be a very similar distinction in uh, the world of classification as well. In model-based classification, rather than directly learning from errors that you make in the world from experience, think like reinforcement learning, model free. Instead, we're going to learn by building a model from our data and then doing inference in that model to make predictions in the world. Okay. After today, we'll look at the model free methods. So in the model based approach, you're going to build some model. In this case, we're going to build a BayesNet and it's going to be a super simple BayesNet called a naive Bayes model. You build a model where the output label and the input features are random variables. 
there's going to be some connections between them and maybe some other variables too that might help you build a better model either in terms of statistical efficiency of having uh, sort of the representations uh, be more compact um, or because that's, that's data that's easier for you to, to elicit. Now you've got this model in which uh, you have a Bayes net and down here somewhere are going to be your features and up here is going to be your class and on the basis of the features X that you observe, you're going to predict the class Y. We can do that with probabilistic inference, variable elimination, for example. So you're going to instantiate your observed features. You're going to query for the distribution of the label you care about, the output, conditioned on those features, and you'll get a probability out. Now, you can ask questions like, how often does my model get the right answer? That's accuracy. You can also ask questions like, do these probabilities that are falling out of my model, are they even right? Some kinds of classifiers don't even give you probabilities. They just give you a prediction. So what are the challenges? What structure should the base net have? Today, we're going to give it the simplest structure that could possibly work, and it turns out it often does. And then the thing we're going to mostly talk about today is how should we learn the parameters of a model from data once we've decided its structure. So here's what a naive Bayes model would look like for digits. It's, in fact, super simple as Bayes nets go. So what we will do is we will assume that there is one special node. It's going to be the label. Here, that's uh, written as Y. And that label's domain will be the various digits, 0 through 9. Then there are going to be a bunch of features. What are the features? Well, you might have a feature for every pixel in the grid that's binary valued. That's either on or off, based on whether it's above or below a certain threshold. So the model itself might look something like this, where the class is the cause, and it independently causes each of those features. Now, if you look at that, you might think, that doesn't sound quite right to me, because there are correlations between the features that are present even when you know the class. And in this naive Bayes model, the conditional independence assumptions say that conditioned on the class, the features are independent. And maybe that doesn't feel right, because if I know it's spam, or if I know it's ham for sure, maybe, are, are the first two words independent? Well... No, they're not. So the naive Bayes assumption is an extremely radical assumption as far as probabilistic models go. But for classification, it turns out to be really effective. Um, and it goes something like this. So if we have a single-digit recognition uh, version of this, we might have a feature for each position of the grid. They'll all be binary-valued. That means this number 1 here maps to this feature. So it'll be a big vector of zeros and ones, which is really just the image. But if my features were instead... How much ink is there on the left side? How many loops are there? Then there would be zeros and ones as well, but they would no longer correspond to the, the, the raw image. So there's a lot of features. Each one here is binary uh, valued. And the naive Bayes model is just what's drawn here. We say that, um, we say that the probability distribution over Y, the class, and all the features, which collectively basically are your input X, is the prior probability of the class. That's what lives at the node Y times the product for all of the other variables of the probability of that variable given its parent, which is the probability of the feature given the class. And that means when you go to make a prediction, uh, it decomposes into a product of a bunch of different feature conditional probabilities, and we'll see examples of that and unpack the inference for that. Okay, so what do you need in general? Okay, that was one example. What do you need in general? A general naive Bayes model places a joint distribution over the following variables. Y, which is your class, and some number of features, which you get to define. You're going to have to write code which extracts them from your input. So if your spam feature is have more than 10 people received this email in the past hour, you have to write code which extracts that the value of that feature, but the machine learning will do the work to connect the probability of that taking on a certain value up to the class. In addition, the way this joint probability is going to work is you're going to have a prior probability of the class, and then a bunch of little conditional probabilities which directly connect each feature up independently to the class. So this whole network, that this whole joint distribution that we're describing is enormous, right? It's going to be exponential in the number of features. But the thing we actually build is quite compact. All we have to have is Y parameters, one for each class value. And then for each feature, we need to have a little description of how likely that feature is for each class. And that's it. So the naive Bayes model will be linear in the number of features, whereas the joint probability distribution that you're implicitly describing is exponential in the number of features. So basically, the thing we have to specify is how each feature depends on the class, and we're going to get that from data. OK. All right. A couple things to get out of the way before we look at the actual data stuff. One is it's a model. So in order to do uh, predictions, you have to do inference. 
Turns out you already know this. There's nothing new here. In fact, it's a simple case of uh, inference by enumeration. So if I would like to compute, the thing I actually want to compute is the probability of y, that is the distribution over all the different class labels given my features. That's what I actually want to compute. But I know that I can just compute the joint version of that, y comma the features. Well, what is that? Well, if that were a lowercase y, it would be a scalar. It would be an entry of the joint probability table. Since it's a capital Y, it's a vector, right? So it's a one-dimensional vector here that has an entry for each value of Y. So there's P of Y1 in the features, P of Y2 in the features, P of Y3, and so on. If I had all of these probabilities and I normalized, I would have the conditional probability of the class given the features. All right, so this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this vector of probabilities of feature and class. How do I get them? Well, for each one of these entries of the joint distribution here, I can rewrite it according to my Bayes net, which is going to be a product of all these little local probabilities. It's the product, each one is the product of a prior probability of the class, which says whether or not, before you see the evidence, this is a class that's common or not, and then um, a product of a bunch of feature probabilities, which is how likely is this feature for this class, how likely is this feature for that class, and so on. All right. So you compute all those products, you normalize them, you're done. Okay, That's it. It's just variable elimination. Okay, so what do we need? We need an inference method. We've just seen this. We have a Bayes net. In this case, it's super simple. It's one that assumes all the features are conditionally independent given the label. Uh, we need um, all of the component probabilities. Nothing new. What's new is now we also, in order to make this work, we need to know what those probabilities are. How likely is it to have the word free in spam? How likely is it that the center pixel will be on for the number seven? These questions can only be answered by going to data. All right, so the things we're going to need to do is we're going to need to figure out the prior probability over labels, and for each feature, which is each kind of evidence, we're going to need to compute a bunch of conditional probabilities for each class. These things collectively, all these probabilities that we use to plug and chug and get our, our numbers out, um, are called the parameters of the model. Formally, they're usually denoted by theta. Um, and as I change the parameters of the model, it's still, say, a naive Bayes model over uh, spam versus ham. But as I change the probability, different things are going to blink in and out as I think this is spam now, I think this is ham now. So those numbers collectively are going to determine which predictions it makes. So it has to come from data which parameters we want. All right, let's see some examples of what these conditional probabilities in a naive Bayes model would look like. So... Um, here's an image. Maybe this is the number three. The first thing we need in order to apply naive Bayes to this is we need a pro prior probability over the class. And so in this particular vector, in these parameters, each class, one to zero, is equally likely. What do you think it is in real, if I went to like r a real collection of data? Well, I could get a thousand examples of the number three and a thousand examples of the number four and a thousand examples of the number five. Probably I should just get like a million or as many as I can get of each number. If I constructed the data set in that way, well, then all these prior probabilities would be equal because in my data, 10% of the examples are one and 10% of the examples are two. What do you think is real? Which number do you think is most common in real data? Or are they all equally common? So zero might be common. Depends on the kind of data you're looking at. If you're looking at zip codes in California, what's the most common thing? It's nine. If you're looking at lots of round numbers, maybe it's zero. If you're looking at sort of um, general numbers, it turns out one is particularly common. You can uh, think about why that might be. So, uh, so these come from data. And this actually underscores the point that depending on how you collect the data, it can actually shape the distributions that you are imagining are going to exist at test time. And we'll come back to that as well when we talk about risk minimization. All right. In addition to the prior probability of each label, which is already maybe a little tricky to get right, um, in our data, we can compute things like, what is the probability that pixel 3, 1 is on given each class? This isn't a distribution over on or off. These are just the probabilities, what I'm showing here, just the probability of that pixel for each class. And it's going to be some number. So for example, the pixel in that position might be pretty likely for the number six, but pretty rare for the number one. And these probabilities will encode that. Okay, And you'll have that for each of the different pixels. So this is what the conditional probabilities in a naive Bayes model 
uh, look like? Where did they come from? Well, this number came from saying, all right, in all of my examples of numbers that are the number five, how often was pixel 3.1 on? Okay, 80% of them, done. That comes from the data. This works a little bit differently in practice when people uh, look at models for text. So when you look at models of something like an image where you have a bunch of these pixels, but you know a pixel here and a pixel there mean very different things, the standard model for text is to say that the, uh, the features are the words and that the random variables are the words at each position. So you would say something like, well, I have a joint probability over the class, which could be spam or ham or document classes uh, or positive or negative sentiment or whatever, along with the rest of the document, the words. The standard way to write that there in a naive Bayes model is to say that's the prior probability of the class. And then the product of across each position in the document, the probability of the word at that position given the class. And so again, this is a naive Bayes model. And, uh, but the random variables now are not something like we're, they're not the presence or absence of individual words. They're the product across each position in the document of what word is at that position. So this is actually interesting because I have, um, in the, in the image case, I had lots and lots of features because it's a big grid, but each one was either on or off, right? With a document, one, they can be of any length and two, each position has a large event space. There's a whole bunch of words that can be at position 23 in a document. But for the purposes of detecting spam versus ham, it doesn't really matter whether a word occurs at position 23 or 24. Right? When you see print cartridge, which is, I guess, two words, uh, at a certain position, it probably doesn't matter what position it's in. And so for these people, look at models which have an even stronger assumption. They assume not only are the features conditionally independent of each other given the class, they also assume that they're identically distributed. And that means the probability distribution over the words at position 23 and the probability distribution over the words at position 54 are the same single probability distribution. And that means for a naive Bayes model for text, the only thing you actually have to learn is for each class what is the histogram of words? What is the probability distribution over words in that class? These are tied distributions. This is called a bag of words model. And this is different than the standard case because um, in the standard case, each feature gets its own distribution. Here, we assume the features are all identically distributed, but there are multiple copies of that feature for the different positions. And this is nice because when the document is longer or shorter, you don't really need to change your model. Or, or this is the first time you've had a document that is you know, one word longer than the longest thing you've ever seen. And you're like, oh man, what does that last word mean? Right? It's the same as it means in any other position. Okay. Let's do an example of, uh, of spam filtering here. In this bag of words model for text, which means the probability over the class and the words is the product of the probability of the class times the probability of each word independently given the class. And remember, the words are identically distributed. So I just go through, and each word that comes in is going to get a probability for each class. And there's going to be a race to see which class wins in terms of probability. So what am I going to do? I'm going to have to see the words that come in, but I'm going to, in the end, compute two things. I'm going to compute the probability of spam along with all of the words, and I'm going to compute the probability of ham along with all the words. And then those will be numbers. They won't sum to one. In fact, they're going to be really, really small numbers. You multiply 100 probabilities together, you get a small number. Small enough that you would have to worry about underflow in practice. So we're going to compute these probabilities. Whichever one is bigger, that's going to be my prediction. If I want to know the probability that I assign, I would have to renormalize. I have to take these two numbers and divide them by their sum. So let's do it. Let's see. We're going to compute incrementally as the words come in, position by position. We're going to compute probability of spam and the words, and probability of ham and the words. So here we go. Um, so let's look at the, the let's look at the, ta the the tables first. I will give you this one actually. Maybe I should have hidden it. Um, it turns out in this corpus, two thirds of the emails are ham, and one third of them are spam. How would you say this relates to the emails you get? Do you get more spam than this or less? 
Probably a lot more. So spam has gotten worse since this corpus was collected. And again, this underscores that just because some, there's some distribution that your data reflects, and then there's the real world, and you want those to be as close as possible. And if there's major, major systematic ways in which your data and the distribution it was drawn from in its construction do not match the distribution in the real world that you're going to field your classifier against, you're going to have issues. One major issue you can have is reduced accuracy. All right, so for these others, if I'm going to build a naive Bayes model for uh, spam filtering, I need to collect the prior, which is going to turn out to be less important than the other components. And then I need to compute for spam, what is the histogram of words? And for ham, what is the histogram of words? So let's look at the spam one first. What do you think is the most frequent word in spam? I heard free. What else? Any other guesses? I heard the. You laugh, but here's the answer. What's going on here? I thought free meant spam. This is not a, an odds ratio. This is not words that are much more likely in spam than ham. This is simply, in this model, the probability of word given class. And in spam, the most likely word is the. Somewhere far down that list is the word free. How about for ham? What do you think is the most likely word? Yeah, it's the too. So these... these it turns out that if you just look, with a couple weird exceptions like 2002, any guesses when this corpus was collected? Um, uh, if you just look at the most common words, this is not where the information is. In fact, the information in a model like this is in the relative probabilities, because they're going to be this race that I talked about here, that we're going to be accumulating two probabilities. And as we go, the joint probability is going to drop, because this particular message is not particularly likely under the document for either class. But for one of the classes, it's going to be relatively speaking, meaning the ratio is going to be much more likely. And so what matters is actually the relative, the, the ratio of these frequencies. So somewhere down there is the word free, which is presumably much more likely in the span. All right. So where do these tables come from? They come from data. Let's do that example I promised you. So we're sitting here. We're the spam classifier. We're a naive base classifier, and we are going to produce a joint probability by multiplying in evidence terms as the words come in. Right now, no t words have come in, which means we only have one term in our product, which is the prior probability of each class. So right now, our running total here would be 0.33 for spam and 0.66 for ham, which means if you ask me now, I would say, that's ham. And if you ask me how confident I was, I would say, uh, I predict two-thirds chance of ham. All right. The terms that are going to show up on the left here are going to be the evidence terms for each word as it comes in. The thing on the right here is the product of all of these terms. What? Minus 1.1. It's not just going to be the product because that product is going to get very small very quickly. It is going to be the log of the product. Okay? So, so far, we think it's ham because the log of that product is higher. All right, next word comes in. Gary! Remember, Gary is not particularly likely under either distribution. This is a generative model, and that means that we're going to have the probability of the features given the evidence, and Gary is not particularly likely for either ham or spam, but what is it more likely for? It's much more likely in ham, right? Direct address, actually knowing who you're writing to, that's much more likely in ham. But it's not particularly likely there why most people aren't named Gary. All right, but if you look, suddenly now, if you stopped me and you said, okay, right now it's time to make a prediction, ham or spam, what would I pick? I would pick ham, because there's a bigger number, right? They're, they're negative because they're logs of probabilities. And if you ask me how confident I was, I would say I'm much more confident. I'm 10 times more confident than I was before, because I've seen this word Gary. All right, Gary, wood. This is one of those words that's actually quite common, but it's not, you know, that asymmetric. It doesn't change my beliefs that much. You can think about these as belief updates. Think back to the HMM. Evidence is coming in. My beliefs update as I multiply in terms of probability. Maybe it makes me think a little more ham, because wood is one of those nice, harmless, common uh, words that uh, occurs in natural text. Gary, wood, you, uh-oh. You is a mildly suspicious word. It's super common, but it turns out it's a little bit more common in spam. But you can see how, like, it's not like I'm going to delete every email that has the word you in it. So we get little bits of weak evidence that need to get aggregated. In this model, the way they're aggregated is multiplying their conditional probabilities. Gary, would you like to lose weight while you sleep? And then once you've seen the whole um, email, 
and you look at the end, you'll notice two things. One, the total probability is very small because I multiplied a bunch of probabilities. That's fine. That's always true in Bayes net inference. I have to, I have to divide both of these very small numbers by their sum to get the conditional posterior that I want. And if you look at this now, it thinks it's spam. Somewhere in there, somewhere around lose weight, it changed its mind. You can see weight is a pretty strong indicator. Apparently so is sleep. Okay. So this is what it's like to be a naive Bayes model. Features come in, you aggregate all of the weak evidence, and then you output. Another nice thing, even though it's sort of, uh, you got to take a step back to see it, is that there was actually conflicting evidence on this example. There was some evidence that it was ham, and there was some evidence that it was spam, and there was a bunch of examples of both, and this all needed to be weighed. And that's what's going on here in the conditional model. All right. Probability of spam, spam, 98.9. Gary was off to a good start, but it went downhill from there. Any questions? Yep. No, uh, the question is, can you use the log for the final? It's actually very common when you're multiplying probabilities to just add log probabilities instead. In the end, when you want to turn it into probabilities, you do need to sum them. And summing the logs won't do that. You need to do a sort of log sum, uh, which one way to do that is to convert them back to, um, to, to probabilities by taking exponentials. That's actually not the way you would do it. You would sort of shift them by their minimum or their maximum as, as appropriate so that you don't get underflow. So when you actually do these things, you got to worry about that. But conceptually, you multiply all the probabilities, you get a small number, and then you renormalize. It's a great question. Here's another model. Here's y, your class. Here's word one, word two, word three, word four, and so on. I can assume that each word depends on the class and also the previous word. What do my con probabilities look like? Well, except for the beginning, and I can get rid of that by having a start symbol. So sort of the workhorse term for this model is what is the probability of uh, word k given word k minus one and the class. Okay. This part without the class is what's called a bigram model. You're predicting words based on the previous word, so you're looking at by two words at a time. And now we've made it conditional on a class. This is a better model of language. If you started, if you did prediction in this and you started with the class and you cranked out a pretend document, it would look significantly more like a real email than if you just did a bag of words where it would just be a bunch of like English looking words in some random order. However, will it be more accurate for classification? It really depends. In general, it'll be a little more accurate, but at a cost of having significantly more complicated uh, conditional probabilities to estimate. How much more accurate will depend on to what degree the bag of words assumption is dangerous. So if I take a spam document and I permute all the words randomly, I've definitely, like, it is no longer syntactically valid English. But it's probably still spam. <laughs> Right? In the same way, like I take a document that's a sports document, and if I'm doing sports versus politics, and I permute the words, and now it's like this whole mess of words, and I can't read it, but it's like, you know, uh, it's like goal, team, win, right? It still hasn't changed. And so if you're looking for a class which is not kind of strongly connected to the actual ordering, Naive Bayes is really good. Otherwise, you add other correlations like this to fix it. Okay. Other questions? You're good questions. All right, a couple more general slides, and then um, we'll take a break. So, actually, I changed my mind. Let's take a break now. Um, we are now into the machine learning section, which means we are done with the spooky Halloween time um, ghost busting section. But I have candy. So during the break, everybody get up and uh, come grab candy if you would like. This gets applause. All right. Come up and grab some, please. I'm not allowed to take it home.
All right, we're going to get started again. Let me say your candy consuming I would rate as middle of the road. You can come back up to the at the end of the class if you would like to to grab more. All right, so let's talk about uh training and testing. So, we talked a little bit about we want to build classifiers. We're going to do it on the basis of data because how the hell uh, how the heck am I supposed to know uh, what pixel 7, 3 is for the number 8. i got to get that from the data. How am I supposed to know what is the probability of, you know, a certain, um, you know, a certain word for a certain class? You go to a collection of data and you, um, and you, you, you find it there. But there's sort of something missing there, which is why are we doing that? We're sort of doing that because we want to do well on the final exam. What's the final exam? The final exam is this classifier is released into your inbox and it actually manages to find all the, the spam with high accuracy. So there's got to be some connection between what's going on in your data, which is what you have, and this future use to which you're going to put the, the classifier to. And a lot of machine learning theory is really based about based on trying to say something precise about the connection between those two things. So what we're going to talk about now is a couple things relating to training, the mechanics of how you do parameter estimation in this particular model. But really, the reason we're doing this is not just for naive Bayes or probabilistic model uh, estimation in general, but to see examples of more general phenomena and trade-offs and concerns that occur in machine learning more broadly. So remember, the general setup is going to be we're going to have a training set, we're going to build a classifier, and we're going to unleash it on the world. So the basic principle of machine learning is something called empirical risk minimization. We'll get into this in a great amount of detail in the next few slides, and then particularly in the next couple lectures after this one. The principle of uh, empirical risk minimization says goes something like this. We would like to find the model, classifier, whatever, that does the best, whatever the best means, on our true test distribution. So maybe we would like to find somehow get the naive Bayes spam classifier, which is most accurate at finding spam in real people's inboxes today. We don't actually know that true distribution. Like, we don't actually know what it's going to see at test time. In the same way that when you go to your final exam, you don't actually know what questions you're going to get. You don't know what distribution they're going to be drawn from. So how do you make progress? Well, what you do know is you have a training set. And you can't pick the parameters which are going to do best for your true test distribution. So instead, we try to pick the best model on our training set and hope there's a connection between those two. Finding the best model on your training set is usually phrased at some level as an optimization problem. Today, we're going to appeal more to just directly um, estimation of probabilities, but by the time we get to uh, optimization-based methods over the next couple lectures, you'll see this more generally. It's usually an optimization problem. Optimize some quantity on my training set in the hopes that that quantity will remain optimized on the test set, or at least nearly so. So what can go wrong here? The main worry, um, and this will be a little abstract now, we'll see some concrete examples coming up, the main worry is that you overfit. The main worry is that in, pr in picking the parameters of your model, for example, the probabilities of various words, on the basis of your training data, you do a really good job of capturing that training data, but it doesn't generalize. This is like you download all the exams from past years, and you optimize, you learn all those answers. And then you go to the, the final exam. And it's totally, totally different questions that look nothing like those. Um, that's going to be a problem. So you worry about overfitting. Now, there's ways you can, first of all, there, there's a couple different things that can go wrong here. One thing that can go wrong when you deploy a classifier is um, the training distribution does actually represent the test distribution. Right, so those practice exams were written by the same people for the same course or whatever as the test exam. But you didn't actually have enough. You just had a couple samples here, and those samples sort of didn't really shine light over the whole space of things that you might encounter. That's a problem of not enough training data. So we try to get as much training data as we can. What else could go wrong? You could have a ton of practice exams, but you could, um, 
you could overfit as a learner. You could just wrote, memorize those examples, those test questions. You get to your final exam, and you're like, wait, it's not one of the ones I memorized. Okay. There the problem might not be with the training set. That or the problem is the, the learning di- the learning overfit to the training set. How do we limit that? Mechanically, we limit that in a couple ways. We limit the complexity of your hypotheses. We'll be able to say precisely what that means later. Um, we penalize sort of overly specific models in various kinds of ways, and we'll see some examples of that even today. And then... Uh, there are other ways this can go wrong. So one way, so how can you do badly on the on, on the final exam? You can have not enough training data, and there's just no way to have sort of seen the whole space. You can have plenty of training data, but you can sort of learn in a way that fails to generalize. And then you can have tons of data drawn from the wrong wrong distribution. What would this mean? This would be like you study and study and study and study all these practice exams. You spend weeks doing practice exams for CS189, and then you walk into the CS188 final. And you're like, something's wrong here. I learned really well. I understand the concepts, but it's just not lining up. Okay, that's that's a drift in distribution. That's where um, your training examples were plentiful, but they were drawn from a distribution which does not match the one that you're going to see at test time. Machine learning theory has the most to say about the first few things, right? How... What's the danger in having a small amount of training data, which means high sampling variance? What's the danger in having hypothesis spaces that are either so big that they can overfit or so small they can't capture what's going in the data? So things like that. This idea of the test distribution sort of being not stationary against the training distribution is something that's really important in the real world, and it's much harder to say precise things about. Okay, let's see some important concepts, and then let's estimate some parameters. So one important concept is data. These are labeled instances for like emails that are marked spam or ham. In general, when somebody gives you a big vat of data, you're going to split it into pieces. You take one piece and you say, this is my training set, right? Someday it'll all be your training set if you want it to be. But when you're doing experiments, you're going to try a bunch of different things. You want to see what works best. Does this naive Bayes thing work? Maybe a neural net. Okay, so you're going to take a piece of your training set, most of it usually, and uh, you're going to take a piece of your data and make it your training set. Then you're going to have to have a test set, which is not the real future test use that it's going to be put once it's deployed, but you need something that is not in your training data to check. This is why you might, when you're studying, take some of those practice exams and not look at them until right before the exam, because you need to check your understanding. And so we take our data and we break it into training, where we learn our parameters, and test, where we check our accuracy. If we check our accuracy on the training data, we will find out it's very, very high. But that won't be true for test. And in practice, there's usually other little shards of the data that you're going to want to have. So for example, one common one is held out data. We'll see today and in future lectures what that's for. So you're going to take your big vat of undifferentiated training data and break it into pieces. You're going to have features, which are these attribute value pairs which characterize the inputs. Classically, these are like little pieces of code you write to detect how many times the word free occurs and whether or not this email contact is in your uh, send, email senders in your contact list and so on. You go through an experimentation cycle. It looks something like this. Get your model and learning already, and then you're going to learn the parameters, like model probabilities on your training set, which involves scrolling through the training set, counting things up, sometimes making predictions, sometimes taking derivatives and taking gradient steps, whatever it is, you're going to learn the parameters of your model, which starts off having no idea between spam and ham. You're going to go through your training data, and after one or more passes through, you're going you're gonna to know your parameters. You're going to need, you're going to have some other things which aren't parameters. Parameters are things like, what's the probability of pixel 73 for the number 8? Then there's hyperparameters like, do I want to have features for the lowercase version of the words in case I've seen the word but never uppercased, right? These are questions about, is this or this or this going to work better? Another kind, uh, where more formally hyperparameters are things like the amount of smoothing. We're going to see that today. Um, and then you'll, and you usually select those on the basis of some held out data. And then finally, once you're ready to see how your experiment uh, turned out, you take that model and you test it on the test data. You don't want your to test your classifiers on the data that was used to train them. 
because they will do surprisingly well. It's like if you go back through and you try those same practice exams, you're like, wow, I really know this stuff now. It's like, no, this was your training data. You always know your training data. The question is, did you generalize? This can happen to your classifier too. So you always want to test your performance on data that was not used to train it. However, you as a researcher are going to be tempted to grab that test data and look at it in great detail and be like, ah, I see, I got this one wrong. And there can be a slow leak of your test data into your training data if you're not careful. So you try not to peek at the test set, um, and that's another reason why we have held out data, which gives you something you can peek at. You want to evaluate. I ran 20 experiments. How did they go? Am I doing well? Is this thing good enough to release? You need to have some metric, and there's a lot of possible metrics. An easy one is accuracy. For how many of these emails... Did I make the correct decision? Fraction of instances predicted correctly. But actually, that's actually not a great accurate, that accuracy is not a great metric for spam detection. Any ideas why? What's wrong with accuracy? Okay, so, so the answer was, the classes aren't balanced. This could manifest itself either as your training set might not match your test set, or somehow they're not going to be equal at test time, and maybe you don't want to think about them equally. Was there another? There was another another comment. So, um, how bad is it if that offer of free print cartridge sneaks into your inbox? What are you going to do? You're going to not read it. It's okay. How bad is it if that email from your boss makes it into your spam folder? It's pretty bad. And so the actual loss or cost of different kinds of mistakes may not be the same. It may not be symmetric. And so accuracy isn't always what you want. What you really want is you want a utility here. You want to know what was my utility. And you should have different costs for these things. And so sometimes people do that. Um, there are also cases like machine translation, where you're always going to be a little bit off, a little word here or there, but there's a difference between being completely off and a tiny bit off. And so there are a lot of different metrics people have for different kinds of tasks. Okay. And again, we're going to talk a lot uh, today and next time about overfitting and generalization. We want a classifier which does well on the test data. We don't have the test data, or we don't have the true test data, so instead we build a classifier that does well in the training data, and then we try to come up with methods where the training accuracy is going to mean something about the test accuracy. Overfitting means fitting the training data very closely, but not generalizing well. There's also the opposite, which is underfitting, where you're just like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just guessing randomly everywhere. That's not overfit. It's not going to work very well. The problem here is not that your test, data, your, your, your test accuracy is low, but your training accuracy was also low because you didn't learn anything. We'll investigate these things formally in a few lectures. I had a really good question uh, um, during the break, which I want to answer for everybody, um, which is, couldn't you just defeat this Naive Bayes spam classifier by pasting the word Gary a hundred times to the end of your offer to lose weight while you sleep? And the answer is yes, you could. And I don't know whether folks here remember, but you know, about 10 years ago, there was a period of time where all the spam I would get would have like chapters of Pride and Prejudice appended to the end. And the classifiers would be like, oh, this is looking bad. Oh, look, Pride and Prejudice. And then it would get through. So spam detection is in some ways a very poor example of a canonical classification problem. Because if you're trying to build a classifier to detect... Um, if you're building, building a classifier to detect the number seven, the number seven's not like trying to squirm its way out from those pixels to avoid detection, right? Um, you can just get better at the task, and if you get perfect at the task, great. Spam is being generated by people who are trying to defeat spam filters. So whatever technique you use, whatever features you use, you're going to capture those kinds of spam emails. Others are going to make it through, and spammers are going to double down on what's working. And so you get Pride and Prejudice at the end when you're looking for language. But then suddenly you start using methods like primarily looking at sender information. And now you have spammers who want to buy contact information or whatever it is so that they can spoof that. And so the um, if you have features that are like, you know, did the same email get sent to a lot of different people? What do spammers do? They're going to start modifying that email in some templated way. Now you have some feature that detects templates. Now it's some, there's sort of an arms race here. And so in that sense, over time, spam classification doesn't actually look like a standard classification problem because it's adversarial. Okay. Any questions before we talk about generalization and overfitting? Okay. So 
in these images, you want to fit the hat right. You don't want it to be too small because if you overfit, you're not going to be able to generalize, but you don't want to sort of underfit either because then you're going to fail to learn the information that's actually in your training data. Here's an example of uh, this trade-off. In general, we're going to do discrete classification, but for this example, let's imagine the thing we're trying to do is to fit a curve to this data. So I could... I can pick. I can pick a model. You, you've probably done this in other classes. I could decide to fit a line. I could fit a curve. I can fit different kinds of models. So one thing I could do is I could fit a constant function. What constant function should I fit if I want to optimize the fit? So you say, what is the fit? Is the fit getting as close as possible to the last dot? Mm, let's say the fit is the sum across all the data points of the squared distance or something. So what is my constant approximation to this? Somebody want to hazard a guess? Let's call it five. Okay, imagine that was a straight line. Uh, imagine that was a slope zero line. Okay, did I fit something about this data? Yeah, I fit something about the data. I fit basically its mean. Um, did I capture the major trends? No, this I would call this underfitting. All right, let's try again. Let's fit a let's let's fit a linear function. Okay, it's close, right? It's a better fit than the constant function. Notice that when I went to linear function, the space of hypotheses grew. Instead of just lines, now it's like lines with slopes and intercepts. Okay, so as my space of hypotheses grow, in general, there are uh, when there's more hypotheses, I can fit my data more closely. All right, I missed something about it. There's the sort of like there's the sort of dip. So maybe I could go to a second order function, like quadratic, if I can draw this. Okay, quadratic. I'm starting to fit my data better. Could I fit it even more closely? Yeah, I could. How about this? Degree 15 polynomial. Way better fit than the quadratic. So it's not just about fitting your data. It's about, you can always fit your data more. It's about fitting your data to the point where the patterns that you are capturing are ones which generalize to test. And that's, that's a tricky balance. This, this is definitely overfitting. And so, you can't basically just judge by your training accuracy, which you can drive higher and higher and higher, how well you're doing. You need some measure of whether you've gone too far um, in the fitting process. And in this case, when we talk about hyperparameters, a hyperparameter could be something like, what's the maximum degree of polynomial I'm allowed? Right? And I could detect on held out data is that as I'm adding more more terms to the polynomial, um, my training accuracy, my training error, the residuals here, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but I can detect that on some held out data, suddenly it's gone crazy because there's this point here in the held out set and you're like, you're nowhere near it. Okay? So that's a general idea here. But overfitting shows up not just on these continuous functions, it also shows up on uh, discrete functions. It also shows up, uh, for example, let's imagine in a hypothetical um, digit classification, we might say, here is an image I've never seen before. Let's use naive Bayes to classify it. So what would we do? We'd do our running total. We'd say, all right, well, I, I ha before I look at any features, the numbers are the numbers two and three, let's say, are equally likely. So let's multiply in evidence terms. Well, for each pixel, for example, this pixel, maybe this pixel is equally likely for a three as a two. Okay, so they're still tied. This pixel is much more likely for a three than a two, let's imagine. So now at this point, I'm thinking this is looking like a three, and I would have a bunch of these terms, one for each feature, in this case, maybe one for each pixel. All right, for this one, this pixel being off is much more likely for a three than a two because a two has that diagonal line. So, so far three is winning, but eventually I'm gonna get to some pixel maybe like this one here. And in my training data, this is almost never on. This is, this is in a corner where there's no number. And maybe it turns out that this number, that this pixel happened, happened to be on once or twice in the data for the digit two, but zero times in the data for digit three. So when I multiply together all these probabilities, which are all roughly reasonable, who's going to win? Two's going to win, because it didn't have that zero. Well, that's bad. This is an example of overfitting, because this probability versus this probability, that is about the idiosyncrasies of the samples I have in my data, whereas perhaps the fact that, you know, um, this is 0.1 and this is 0.7, that might actually be a, 
that might be actually be a more enduring fact that transfers from my training to my test. All right, let's look at examples of overfitting. Remember we talked about what's the most likely word given ham? The, what's the most likely word given spam? The. I can instead ask when I do these multiplications together into that running product, which are the words which sort of swing the product most one way or the other? I can look at odds ratios which is the ratio of the probability in the two. And if the ratio is one, it means it's equally likely. Whether it's common or uncommon, it doesn't affect the competition. It's things that are more common in one than the other that have a big impact on these odds ratios. So let's look at words. What do you think in my training data for ham versus spam, things with the highest odds ratio for ham would be? These are things that are significantly more likely for ham than for spam. Words like Gary, except when I look at my data, it's actually a mess. It turns out, there are a bunch of words in this data which occur in spam once and occur in, uh, occur in ham once and occur in spam zero. And if you just say that the probabilities in your model are the probabilities in the data, you're going to give probability zero to a lot of things through overfitting. The probability of southwest, which occurs once in ham and zero in spam, it's not zero in spam. Just like that pixel being off wasn't zero for the number three. It's just zero in my data. It's really dangerous to give things probability zero. That's one of many kinds of overfitting, where the exact details of which sample points you drew when you collected your data get captured to sort of uh, uh, in a way that doesn't generalize. Then there's going to be things in spam, which are you know a bunch of other things that occur once in spam but never in ham. So something went wrong here. What went wrong here is really we should not go about giving probability zero to things that we haven't seen just because we haven't seen them yet. And the exact mechanics of overfitting are going to vary from model to model. In naive Bayes, probabilistic models, overfitting usually shows up as sampling error, which, or sorry, sampling variance, which usually shows up as zeros in your probability table. For other methods, it's going to show up in totally other ways. Okay. All right. We actually talked about all of this. So to do better, we need to smooth or regularize our estimates. So let's figure out some ways to do that, to just illustrate what it would look like to limit, um, to limit overfitting. We already know one kind of limitation of overfitting. We could take that polynomial, and we could limit the degree of the polynomial. That's shrinking the hypothesis space. As you shrink a hypothesis space, you, you, you fit less. If you shrink it too much, you underfit. We could also do that with words. We could say, I'm only actually interested in the 100 most common words. That would be shrinking my hypothesis space. That's one way to do it. We can also regularize, which is we can try to come up with estimates for our probabilities or weights in general, which are not completely driven by the data, but are also balanced against some regularizing function or smoothing function that makes things a little flatter, something that hedges. So... Let's take a look um, at the distribution of a random variable. Let's sort of show why we need to do these kinds of things. How are we going to figure out what the uh, what what a random variable is? We can do elicitation, right? You can ask a human. You can go to a doctor and say, "Hey, I'm building a classifier. What fraction of people with meningitis will uh, present with a fever?" And a doctor can can give you a guess, right? Maybe qualitative. Um, you could also do that empirically. You could use training data. You could go collect a bunch of records of patient uh, patient treatment or something like that. And this is basically what, what learning does. You take your training data, you take the trends out of the training data. The simplest version of this is for each outcome to look at the empirical rate. So for example, if I am a jelly bean counting, um, if I'm a jelly bean counting robot and I am trying to figure out in this vat of jelly beans how many reds versus blues there are, and I draw three jelly beans and it's two reds and two blues, well, what can we do? There's the maximum likelihood estimate or relative frequency estimate, which says, okay, the probabilities are just the counts in the training data. That means the maximum likelihood probability of red for this data is two-thirds. Is that right? Well, the more samples I draw, the more accurate that's going to be. In general, we don't have as many samples as we want, so we're going to want to do something to prevent things like zeros in these estimates. Okay. Why is this called maximum likelihood? So here's my corpus. We can call it D. There's my corpus. There are a bunch of different probabilities I could say for red. I could say they're 50-50. I could say it's 100% red. For each probability I assign to red and one minus that goes to blue, 
I can compute the probability of D. Okay, that's something you could try writing out for yourself. Of all of those probabilities, the one that matches the frequency of the data is the one that maximizes the probability of the data. So, um, so that's a thing you can do, and it's totally reasonable, but in practice, you need some smoothing. So I guess we have some Halloween ghosts after all, even though we're now into the post-Halloween lectures. Um, but we just want, we want no surprises to our model. We want our model to assign probability to events it's never seen so that one errant pixel or word that is rare doesn't completely torpedo an otherwise very nuanced balancing of evidence. All right. So what was the maximum likely, likelihood estimate? The maximum likelihood estimate, basically, you have to work this out, right? Um, maybe we can just go back and do it real quick. Okay, so let's say R is my probability of uh, red, and 1 minus R is my probability of blue. What is the probability of this data? Well, it's basically I got an R, and then I got another R, and then I got the other thing, which is 1 minus R. So as I change the probability of red, this term, which is the likelihood of the data, is going to go up and down. And the balance, uh, the point where that's going to be maximized, you can sort of, uh, you know, if you, if you sort of set it up carefully, de take derivatives, find the extreme point, you'll get uh, the relative frequency answer out. So um, the maximum likelihood estimate says, find me the parameters, probabilities, um, which make the data most likely. Well, that's fine to make the data likely, but I actually don't want that. That's not what I want. Um, what I want is to consider the, uh, the problem of, given my data, which parameters are most likely. It sounds like it's basically the same thing, and it almost is, except for one term. So what I really want is something like a posterior estimate, a maximum posteriori estimate, uh, which says, I would like the theta which is most likely given my data. What's that mean? Well, we can use Bayes' rule to write that. That means find me the parameters which maximize the product of this, which is what we were doing before. This, new, this denominator here doesn't matter. It's just some constant that doesn't change as I change theta. But there's this extra term, p of theta. And so what this says is it says if I want to know what parameter, what probability is most likely, I need to weigh the likelihood of the data against how likely I think that parameter is in the first place. And if I think zeros aren't very likely, then there's going to have to be some balance uh, that is struck. Okay, so this doesn't have a closed form solution without giving you more information. You can uh, look at CS281A to learn a lot more about that. But here's a basic idea of how you might approach it. Um, this is actually due to Laplace hundreds of years ago now, um, who's a philosopher who kind of uh, worried about things like, well, how do I estimate the probability? Like, what is the probability the sun will rise in the morning? Every morning so far, it's risen. So probability one. But I know that can't be right, because at some point, perhaps quite far out, the sun will once not rise. So I know that, I know that this estimate is wrong, and I need some way of mechanically incorporating the fact that there are events which I haven't seen, but which I know to be possible or at least that I'd like to model as being possible. Why do we want to do this? Well, we'd rather not have our robots just like totally freak out at unseen events, though I suppose actually if the sun doesn't show up, that's probably grounds for freaking out. So here's Laplace's uh, procedural estimate. Laplace said, well, basically, it's a pretty good idea to take into account the probabilities in your observation, but you should hold out an extra observation for everything you didn't see to reflect it potentially happening at some point in the future. So basically add one to all your counts, including the ones that are zero. So the maximum likelihood estimate for red, red, blue, if I say what's the probability of red, comma, probability of blue, two-thirds, one-third. Laplace would say, instead of saying there's two of one and one of the other, which normalizes to two-thirds, one-third, add one to each. So instead of two reds, there's three. There's those ones plus my pretend red. And instead of one blue, there's two, because I have my pretend blue. Now what do I get? I get three-fifths and two-fifths. Red is still winning, but this distribution has gotten flatter. And if there had been zero blues, it would no longer have be given probability zero. So pretty reasonable. We can do better. We can say we imagine you see each outcome k times, 
instead of one time, because maybe one time is too many or maybe it's too few. We can adjust formally if you derive this. This comes from uh, adjusting the strength of the prior. And you can, um, you can imagine wanting to do more or less than adding one. And so if I add zero, if I take Laplace's extended method and I add zero, then I just get my two-thirds, one-third estimate from red, red, blue. We know if we add a count of one and we pretend, well, there's one phantom R and one phantom blue, we'll get three-fifths. But if I add 100, there's now 100 of these. There's 100 of those Rs, and there's a whole bunch of blues, too, and there's 100 blues. Now how many reds do I have? Well, I do my computations as if I had 102 blue reds and 101 blues. And suddenly, even though there are still more reds than blues, in my posterior estimate here, it's pretty close to 50-50. So as I crank up K, I have a stronger prior, and I fit less. If I crank down K, I fit more. And so I now I have a dial which can trade off the amount of fitting against generalization. Okay. It is, um, it is certainly not the case that this is the only way to estimate probabilities or that estimating probabilities is the only kind of machine learning. We will see a whole bunch of other things in the next few lectures. But what is important is that in general, there will be knobs you can turn which cause you to do more generalization or less generalization, and that can control fitting. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the conditionals. I think I'm going to skip this too. All right, so let's go to real naive Bayes. So in a real classification problem, you have to smooth if you're going to use naive Bayes. And so, for example, I can go into my um, my spam, and instead of uh, computing odds ratios on the maximum likelihood or empirical relative frequency estimates, I can instead do some smoothing and see after that smoothing what, it, what has the biggest odds ratio. And suddenly things that only occurred once, they don't percolate to the top because they haven't occurred enough to overwhelm that flat prior that I'm associating them with. So this is the top of the odds ratios for ham on the left, and favoring spam on the right. Some of these maybe make sense. Like, there it is, money. Freeze probably in there somewhere. If you see money, that's a good sign that it's spam. Or capital order, or credit, presumably credit card, I don't know. There's some things that uh, indicate ham. This looks like general English text. What is going on there? Helvetica versus Verdana. Spammers use Verdana. What is this? This reflects the default fonts that were in use at this time across different platforms. And so one of the things you find in machine learning is you know what you think the features are going to be, or, or rather which features are going to be useful, but you might be wrong. Sometimes things surprise you. And that's why it's always good to like actually look into your model and see what has been learned here. Is there something that I can learn about this problem from what the machine has learned about the problem? All right. Let's see. We talked about tuning. So let's say I build my naive Bayes model for spam, for digits, whatever. I've got my features. Let's say they're mostly words and pixels, um, though in your uh, projects uh, you'll see you can do better. Um, and I have some tuning to do. Like for... You know, again, this is for naive Bayes. Every method is going to have a different incarnation of this, but uh, I can change the strength of my priors. If I crank K to zero, I'm not going to smooth at all, and I'm going to fit my data very well. If I crank K to a million, I'm definitely not going to overfit, but I'm also not going to learn anything. So somewhere in between is the right amount. How do I figure out the right amount? Well, I can look at my training data and see where am I more accurate. But the K that's going to be most accurate on my training data is zero. Because that's, that's what actually fits the training data best. That's the maximum likelihood estimate. And so what you need to have is in addition to your parameters, which are these kind of basic counts and things like that, um, that you're going to set on your training data, you need to have some held out data that you can do things like, all right, given these counts, how much smoothing am I going to do? What's that right balance between fitting enough but not too much? So we learn our parameters from the training data and which, what the, is actually the parameters is going to depend on the model. We tune them on some different data, like some held out data. Because otherwise you'll get crazy results. And then eventually you're going to uh, take the best value, do some final test, uh, final test, test run. Okay. Um, I'm going to say a very little bit about features because I think it's important for when we start to get to neural nets where the story here is going to change. So um, 
in general, your model is going to make errors. We're going to talk more about this starting next lecture, but your model is going to make errors. Here are some examples of errors that the quick naive based system I whipped up does makes on this training set. Here's one example. Dear Globalscape customer, we've partnered with Scansoft to offer you something. And then there's this other one that's also an error, which is to receive your $30 Amazon promotional certificate, click on this. Okay. One was spam that should have been ham, one was ham that should have been spam. These are tricky cases, and it's actually very hard to tell from the words which one's which. And in fact, in this case, it might actually just be noise in the data. So what are you going to do when you make errors? Well, one thing is, in general, you're going to need more features. So in spam classification, we found out that it wasn't enough to just look at words. You got to look at other sort of metadata from the ecosystem. For digit recognition, you do a sort of more advanced things than just looking pixels. At pixels, where you look at things like edges and loops and things like that, try to do things that are invariant to rotation and scale and all of that that vision folks think about. You can add these as sources of information by just adding variables into your naive Bayes model, but we'll also talk in the next few classes about ways to add these more flexibly and also ways, in, uh, in, ways to induce these. All right, I'm going to stop there for today. And uh, as you go, please come up and grab some more candy. Thank you. <laughs>